it's great to, to be here as a part of the Amaze and Connect South Africa events. And um, it's great to be part of a, of a festival where that brings together art, technology, design, performance, and making as well. So um, what we're doing tomorrow, we, we are going to have like a, some sort of a, a networking event. And we're bringing together on the street, just very close to the neighborhood's market, uh, a group of um, designers, makers, artists to, to share their practices, but also to uh, invite uh, the public to, to make things with them, to play and to learn. And they all are going to be talking about their practices, but actually we thought that this was a great chance today to, to talk about um, maker culture here and um, why we're here as part of the Amaze Festival and how um, games or making and technology and art come together. Um, so we will have a discussion, but uh, very quickly I thought that I should just do a very quick introduction about my work as well, so, so you know who I am and <laughs> what I'm doing. So. Um, so I work for the um, for two organizations in London. One is called Watermarks, where I curate the exhibition program at Digital Arts Exhibitions. And um, this was my first exhibition there in 2009, I think it was. And it was exploring DIY media and hacking and uh, making and uh, art and design as well and uh, reappropriation. Um, so, so we have loads of installations around the building. Like the top one is uh, was uh, a, a robotic installation outside the the, the loose, and it was replacing the sign of the of the loose. So every time somebody was going close, then it would quickly draw a, ma a female or a male uh, image, so they knew where which uh, loose to use. Um, and uh, and then another thing that I'm I'm just going to go through very quickly because we only have five minutes for each person to. to to introduce themselves. So um, the, another thing that I started there last year was a, a technology and performance festival, which was looking at uh, collaborative practices, but also intersections of um, art design, performance, uh, making as well, and games. Uh, and it's happening again in November this year, and we're looking at networks. Um, and uh, Again, part of the uh, of the exhibition program is just to to engage people with making to and understand the things that we're exploring. So it's uh, so very much the uh, the, um, uh, the the format is like learning or talking through objects, but also through making things. So um, so we had this exhibition at the beginning of the year, which was looking at the history of TV and um, uh, and the uh, like all the connections with art and throughout the, uh, the history. And uh, we had invited a group of people to work with the artists and uh, explore technology and microbiology and, uh, and the history of TV as well. Um, so my, my other role is uh, working at the digital, uh, sorry, for the digital programs team at the Victoria and Albert Museum in central London. And um, we set up the team there in 2008. And um, one of the interests was to like to explore what the role of the museum is uh, in digital culture and making. So, um, so I was very much interested in uh, the idea of like a collaborative, um, art, uh, yeah, co collaborative format, but also in using the the museum as a way to not just uh, promote uh, young uh, people's work, but also to bring together established artists with emerging artists, but also to 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 get people to work together and uh, to. Uh, to use uh, breaking and hacking and playing as uh, the tools for learning as well, because we are based in the learning department. Um, so this was the Open Frameworks Lab, which was um, uh, which is basically an open source uh, C++ tool. Uh, it broke, it was the first lab that I did get there as part of the Digital Design Weekend, which is my annual festival, and it's happening next weekend. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and the Open Frameworks Lab uh, invited uh, the public with a group of artists from the international open framework community to work together and to, um, to explore uh, computer and human uh, interaction. So they, they built loads of prototypes during the weekend and there were some collaborations that came out of there which are still going on and they are um, working together. Um, and uh, Sorry, I'll just go through this very quickly. Then another thing that uh, I started there was uh, a series of hacks 
uh, or collaborative making labs and uh, that started last year and um, we used the idea of like, technology and making and design as ways of exploring important issues, for example climate change or environmental uh, issues and uh, disasters, but also how design can um, help sustain sustainability, but also how can communities come together and um, to, to create to, yeah, to, to create and um, like how design can be used for social change as well. So we did this hack with a led with a by scientists from the Met Office and also the public and uh, designers and artists and we created like loads of prototypes and uh, some of these projects are still going um, ahead and we're going to present some at the uh, uh, climate change summit I think in Paris in 2015. So so this was just very this is pretty much the format that we've been using uh, inside so a bit mad <laughs> but it's just it's it's kind of I was interested in the idea of like subverting like the uh, a role of the, the the format of the museum where you can't touch things, you can't do anything. You so I wanted to create like a a, a, a big open space where you could make things, you could meet people, and um, this is kind of uh, pretty much the idea that we want to explore tomorrow as well at the at the at the market hack. So it's a great opportunity to to bring some people from the um, from the MAs events and of course the Connect South Africa events and Fakugesi and. Um, invite them to take part to meet the artists and uh, play and make uh, together. And um, I'm just going to very um, to invite now the um, the guys who are going to be sewing. Some of the guys who are going to be sewing work together tomorrow there to um, to talk like very quickly just to do five minutes or less about their work. And then we're going to move here and have a a discussion. And you are invited, of course, to to take part. Hello, my name is Dino, and academically I'm an electrical engineer. Um, in my day job, I am a software engineer. And there's me hard at work in the lab. I went to uh, Bits University just up the road over here, uh, where I did my undergraduate and my postgraduate studies in electrical engineering. Um, and I found that I had real love for electronics while I was there. I loved working with electronics. And whilst doing my masters, um, I met Tegan of the uh, digital arts uh, school at Wits, and she introduced me to a whole bunch of cool people, and like really opened me up into working, doing using like engineering skills, but exploring like a more creative side. Um, so one of the first things we did together was myself, Tegan, and Jill, who's uh, a printmaker. We actually made circuit boards in the print studio, uh, which I thought was really cool. And I learned a lot from that, like how to make better circuit boards. And they learned that you could make circuit boards in a print studio. Um, and then there's a piece like that Tegan, uh, that's one of Tegan's pieces there, which I helped her um, do some electronics design. I stole some pictures from your website. <laughs> and then other than that, like since then I pretty much become like the go-to or a go-to like technical collaborator for like a whole range of people. So this is um, a thing we did with uh, some architecture students and we erected a pavilion structure uh, in a public space um, and it's got like an interactive wall and you walk up to the wall and the lights like switch on and off and uh, it was really fun. I like this project because it was like on a really big scale, so it was nice to be involved. You know, usually I'm working on like small electronics, and this is like, you know, and there's like people interacting with it and stuff. It was really fun. That's just another shot from the side. So most of the time, I'm asked to put lights in things. It seems so. I do that a lot of the time. Um, this is a piece by a designer. Those are like crinkled up mineral water bottles. And they also light up like when you wave your hand around them, and they screw in and out. Um, so I keep like, like I said, my day job is um, doing software engineering, but I keep like a little electronics workshop at home, and I'm always like tinkering and trying to think of like something cool to make, um, and at the same time collaborating with other people. This was um, a collaboration with a local artist, Colleen uh, Albro, who. Uh, this was like a mine scene and like we made these little men like move and like whir and these lights like flicker so it looked like a really animated uh, mining thing. 
I've done some of my own stuff. Um, this project, I turned the blinds in my apartment into a display. So those are like all the vertical blinds and you can still like close them and open them. Uh, and then I put a whole bank of LEDs across and you could write letters and words and messages. Um, I had it set up to like be in sync, like a, an equalizer thing with the music playing from a laptop. So that was, that was lots of fun. Um, so yeah, I do enjoy, you know, coming up with some of my own stuff and, and working on my own things. Currently, this is what I'm working on right now, which is um, tagging old records uh, with these little electronic tags, which are linked to like a digital playlist. And then you put it on the record player, and then it scans it, and then it plays your digital playlist. So it has nothing to do with the actual vinyl record. But then you can have like a whole library of records with these little tags and be like, oh, this is Summer Hits 2014, and then you can play it. Um, so that's me. I'm the engineer who likes to collaborate and work with people from all different types of industries. Hi, I'm Cardi Whitaker. I'm an artist. Uh, a digital artist and I also do some lecturing as well. I have a fine arts background and I did my MA in digital interactive media here in Fitz as well. Um, I've just chosen three projects to show you, three artworks of mine to show you. The first is called Talking Codes and it was a two series of QR codes that I knitted because I have a quite a fascination with making and using my own hands to make something and mold something and somehow that is that and the association with technology I really like the conversation that starts to form between those two different mediums so the the there was so there were six QR codes that's just a close-up of them sorry and what happened was is they each had a a, a conversational prompt embedded in the QR code which you could SMS to a specific number um, so the first series was hey hi I'm and the second was who why and how and so when the when the uh, viewer scanned the QR code the prompt came up and they could then send an SMS and hopefully add to that and then it would go to a single cell phone positioned sorry I'm getting so confused there sorry that's the cell phone there below and the idea was that a conversation with this one single cell phone would begin to start using multiple audience members the second project I did was a brand activation for um, guillotine which is a fashion label and what we did was again use a QR code to access uh, her, their Facebook page and once the Facebook page was liked what would happen was we had this installation in her shop window and it would trigger motors which we positioned at the top of the mannequins to, um, to run and we attached bobbins and thread to them and then the thread to the bottom of the jacket and then the jacket would sort of roll up sort of see that there <laughs> and so here what it was about was about looking at the way she addressed clothing the designer and the form that it took and how could we use the interaction to to extend that, that her interaction with cloth and clothing and the way she cut things so there's just a close-up of the bobbins in action and there's the just a single mannequin and then the third project is one that I've done quite recently, which I'm in the beginnings of working through and resolving various um, decisions around it. But it was a, an, a 3D interactive sculpture. Um, so there were three layers of LEDs, and each were triggered by certain levels of carbon monoxide in the air. This was at a specific exhibition so when the carbon monoxide would reach a certain level, it would trigger a certain the next level of LEDs to light up, etc., etc. And here it was about creating something that was invisible, visible through light and through 
technology and reading the information that is in the air that we can't actually see with our eyes? How do you represent that visually and physically within the sculpture? So there was a lot of work, a lot of making, with, and a lot of it became quite craft-like, my process of making this sculpture. Yeah, that's it. Hi guys, my name is Daniel. Hang on, wait, what? Do I just push right and left? Yeah. Sorry guys, technology will save us, is the name of our business, and it really will. My name, hang on, I, this is, hello everyone in the back. My name is Daniel. Hey. Uh, my name is Daniel, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Technology Will Save Us. I am originally from Johannesburg, uh, Joburg, and I also studied at WITS. I, I feel like a lot of us have. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a bit of a dumb thing to say that, but uh, I'm very thankful that I was able to study at WITS because it actually gave me some crazy interest in doing mad things. Who would have thank? Um, but yeah, now I live in London, in East London, not the one in the Cape. Um, yeah, it's really funny when I tell people I come go to East London, they're like, but you're in East London. Anyway, so uh, what is Technology Will Save Us? Um, I'm going to sort of share very briefly in this short couple of minutes why this company exists and what we believe in and how we sort of approach it. Uh, don't worry, it'll be quick. We, it all began here in the trash, um, which is always a good place to find cool stuff. Uh, we discovered a laptop in a trash can uh, in East London, in Hackney, which is East London. And uh, we, just, we were like, no way somebody would throw away a laptop. It was a laptop bag. There'd be nothing in it. There was a laptop inside it with a power supply, perfect fresh Windows XP installed on it, nothing else. I was like, it just looked like somebody thought, hey, that bag is gathering dust, toss it away. And that just made us think, wait a second, there's a big conversation to be had around what people know about the technology in their lives how they approach it when it, they're done with it. What do you do when you're finished with your technology? How can you repurpose it if that's an option? Is it an option? Do you even know how? So we're really intrigued by the fact that here in this super developed world of London, you think people have an idea how to actually deal with things like this, but they have none. So we wanted to help them with that. And the rest of the world, if possible. Um, so the whole story is that we're about instigating 21st century learning. So right now there's this whole, like we all have technology, it's not going anywhere, it's here to stay. It's really important that we all know how to start dealing with it uh, again as it sort of goes past its use-by date. Um, and so we came up with a series of these uh, kits which we call gadgets anyone can make. They're sort of things that you can make that are useful in your everyday life. They're not just a one-off thing, hey I just made this cool thing and it bleeps and now I'm done. It's more about making usefulness in your life, but you made it with technology and you hand made it, right? So soldering is one of our, our favorite things. We believe people should be learning how to uh, make, play, code, and invent. Soldering is one of those skills. Programming is one of those skills. Being able to craft things with your hands is one of those skills. Um, so some of the, very quickly, I'll show you some of these kits. This is called the DIY instrument. It's 15 components, well actually no, it's more components. The original one was 15 components. There's about, I don't know, maybe 18 components. You put them together and suddenly you have a light to sound musical instrument, which you can plug into an Arduino uh, and control and create like a crazy orchestral experience because of course that's what you want to do. Um, but the cool thing is, is uh, has anybody heard of a theremin? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the right crowd for that. Um, it's got a theremin. Amazing. Yeah, they're, such a, they're such amazing devices. I've, I've tried one once, I'm terrible at it. It's like impossible to play. They're, you need a PhD. Um, but anyway, this was based, the idea was, in, it, this, we called it originally the, the Fingerman, which is a terrible name. <laughs> we changed it. Um, because the idea was that you use your body to interrupt a light beam, which uh, basically hits a sensor and controls the volume and the pitch of this thing's amazing sound. Um, it was also our first kit. This, this kit over here is called the Thirsty Plant Kit. Um, who here has pot plants? Yeah. How many have you killed? <laughs> Let's be honest, guys. All of you have killed the pot plant. Okay? Well, the whole point of this kit was to help people to quickly and easily make a twist together component, well, twist together a couple of electronic components, throw some solar power in there, a couple of acrylic pieces. Do you guys know what acrylic is? Is it always a place to last year? I can never remember. I think plastic. Anyway, um, Oh, and when, you're thirsty, when your plant is thirsty, the LED flashes. Amazing, so easy. But there's no solder even required for that one. So it just shows that you can actually make something useful that will actually save your plants. 
And then of course, seeing as this is about gaming, this whole festival, thought it would be good to talk about this one, the DIY gaming kit. This is the one with our sort of longest tail of learning. You can solder it. After you finish soldering it, you learn how to program a game. So you go through a series of classes to ultimately program your own really simple game. Wired Magazine called this the Game Boy's deformed younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I kind of agree, and I love that description, because it really is a really low res version of a Game Boy. Um, after this, I had to buy a Game Boy, and I was like, oh, I miss this stuff so much. Uh, but the cool thing is, so what you do is you program a game, and what that makes you realize is you've just learned how to program. So the, the vehicle to learning how to program and understanding gaming logic, really interesting. So this is kind of a oopsie. We call it on and off tech, on and off screen, in the classroom and around the kitchen table. So that's where this kind of learning and making should be happening. And that's what we try to kind of get people to do. Uh, tomorrow at the Market Hack, I've got about eight DIY gamers for people to play with. So come along, play some games, or make your own animations. It's quite nice to see animations in a, well, eight by eight grid of LEDs. So uh, I think that's the end. Thank you very much. Uh, who's next? This gentleman. Yeah. Hello, my name is Ron van der Ende. I'm 28, and I started off with 3D and art and everything at Open Window in Centurion. I don't know if you guys know about that, that place. Um, so I didn't start off in electronics, I didn't start off in the real world. I was just like hooked to the computer and, and learning this amazing machine. Um, so now I'm an owner of a makerspace. So that's a, that's a big difference. Um, so there's some of my stuff that I started off with, some 3D animation. We, we ended up going, we started our own studio, me and four friends, and, and ran that for a couple of years. And then I got sick of advertising. Um, I moved to this space. So that looks just like a messy office with some, some you know, supplies and whatnot. But through that door on the left, uh, um, that's that's a current project, turning that into a hybrid. Um, CNC mills, so we can machine uh, parts. Do you guys know what a CNC mill is? Yeah. Uh, there's head shaking like this. So that table down there is controlled by the machine. It can move up to a thousandth of a millimeter, a micron. Okay, so that moves like this. You can put like half a ton on there, um, moves backwards, forwards, and the entire drill at the, at the top moves up and down. So it literally sticks a drill into the metal and then forces it sideways, and you can cut out patterns in, in 3D. Uh, the, yeah, they can see I'm, I'm busy doing a stator for a, a, a brushless motor that I'm, it's a, it's a trial or a little test. Um, a, a lathe, you know, you guys know what a lathe is? <laughs> okay, so that round part there on the left, where my shadow of my finger is, see that part there? So you put a chunk of metal or wood or whatever in there, and it spins it, and then this whole thing with the, the wheels and whatnot, you, you move a blade and you can cut out the profile. So you can make nice, um, around flywheels and whatnot. Uh, so that's the entire space. So first thing is, me and my brothers, we wanted a 3D printer. <laughs> um, the, the online documentation was really, really difficult to follow. I don't really know much about code. So first thing first is uh, Arduino. There, somewhere there. Um, and because we've got the machines and my brother studied uh, how to use them, uh, I learned from them. Uh, we made these parts here. You see the corners and get some threaded rod and screw it together and program the firmware. It's, it's pretty much like drawing a line on a 2D screen when you've got a start and an end, you know, X and a Y. Uh, we just do that in 3D space so that the, the head of the, the printer moves in 3D while it squeezes out plastic. So that's, uh, that's the first thing we printed out. Uh, yeah, so it started printing its own replacement parts that are <laughs> lighter. 
Um, yeah. Okay, so next project was I wanted to figure out how, how do these drones work. Um, the, the, again, the, the online documentation was really difficult for me to understand. So I took three months on and off and developed the, the flight control code. So that, that gets in the, the gyro and uh, figures out where the earth is, where it is, how much power to push to the motors to cancel oscillation and everything. A uh, really fun project. I've got a crazy video online, if we've got internet, of a camera on this thing, well, previous version, and uh, the code was buggy, so it, it just flew and crashed, but this one works very well. <laughs> so I, I took down a, a, a drive down on my own with the quadcopter and like a, 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 a little break, a holiday, and I stopped in little towns and villages and stuff and flew, and it's amazing the, the kids, the, the locals, have just come running and they, they want to see what is this thing. And I show them the wires because it's all open. I can tell them this wire goes there, you know. Um, that's, that's the current thing that I'm working on. Um, I want to build bigger robots. So, <laughs> if anyone can help, we can machine them. Um, yeah, so that's the tools. So th this is sort of the stack that I'm using. So it's Arduino and a JSON. So anyone that knows JSON, we send JSON straight to the microcontroller and it passes it and it responds in JSON. So it's like an API, like a web service. Um, and then Node.js and Sub.io and Serial Port provides the, the interface that talks all the way through down to the electronics. Um, yeah, and this is what we're offering. So we are opening up the, the makerspace for anyone. So it's a thousand bucks and free training. They can use the space, whatever. Yeah, uh, that's it. Okay, um, hi everyone. I'm gonna sit so you can see. We're gonna really fly through this because there's quite a bit to get through. Um, okay, um, this is Daniel. Um, I'm Jared. Uh, we're both mechatronic engineers uh, from Stellenbosch. Um, kind of like yeah, <laughs> no, we're the only ones that I want from bits here. Um, we um, yeah we we've always kind of been like the kind of bastards of engineering, jumping around mechanical, electronic, software, arts. We just kind of fly around. So um, yeah, what we basically do. We uh, consult uh, with open source hardware, so we design, uh, uh, prototype, manufacture, and mass um, all sorts of consumer electro electronic products, artworks, things like that, all based on, um, on open hardware. Um, we have a web store where we sell the stuff, try and get people hooked and, uh, and using it in their, in their everyday work life. Um, I'm going to show you quickly a, a few projects that we, we've kind of done over the last two years. Um, really fly through them because there's a lot of pictures, um, but you'll see we kind of kind of cross cross uh, discipline. We scatterbrains do lots of different things. So let's go. So the first we started off in the banking industry. Uh, we used to do a whole lot of um, cash, cash, cash yeah. So, so your ATMs, all stuff. that boring stuff, and we kind of tried to uh, change that a little bit. So we did uh, Bitcoin wallets, little like pocket pocket chip tokens. Load Bitcoins on. You can trade around with them. Give them away. Uh, uh, spectrometers, handheld spectrometers for validating security prints um, that actually is commercialized now. All done, that's actually an Arduino sitting inside there, and we replace a million rand spectrometer with a little Arduino. Seven rand Arduino. Yeah, <laughs> that's the production of the thing. The top left is the uh, top, yeah, top right for you guys, be that's the sales version packaged and ready to go. Yeah, and that's a nice little case. What's the spectrometer? Um, you it's it, you it, it, the mic. Oh, sorry. So, so, um, share the mic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically what that guy does is uh, it checks banknotes and tells you whether it's uh, counterfeit or not. It also tells you what the, the denomination of the banknote is. So you scan, say, a 50 rand note. It tells you it's a 50 rand note and it's this quality or um, what not. So you can determine whether your money's real. Uh, it basically tells you what it's made out of. So with reflectance, light reflectance, it tells you what the substance is in front of it. Uh, and our banknotes are very special in that regard. Uh, CIT vehicles, um, we've done a whole lot of prototyping on one-man CIT vehicles and things that can drive themselves and drones that shoot out of them and 
all sorts of crazy things. Um, next, okay, this uh, we do a whole lot of stuff for stage um, and performance. So we we're actually uh, we do a lot of boards and electronics. Um, so this is a this goes into a violin or a cello bow. Um, it's got programmable pixels, um, and it figures out so you can actually remotely control your orchestra and change what they look like and um, display animations on them. And as they ge their gestures go, you can uh, change the mood of the whole thing. Um, we've collaborated with a couple of artists here. Uh, so uh, Jenna Burchell, um, she made this um, artwork homing. Uh, we helped port this um, to Linux uh, in process uh, in pure data. Um, that's the sketch on the left. So basically what it does is it, um, when you touch one of those wires, it'll play a sound of the city that it's installed in at the moment. So when she set it up in Pretoria, you touch one of, this, one of the strings and you can hear Hardy does fly over, or you can hear taxi hooters, or you can hear all sorts of interesting sounds of just that area. And then uh, we've got a little personal quirk. We do quite a lot of biohacking stuff, um, specifically implant-based sensors and that type of stuff, and we did our own implants. Yeah, so if you're interested later, we'll show some videos of us actually doing the surgeries, but uh, we've, we've got different tags in our hands uh, that can be scanned by phones, so it's got our social media and things like that. It's part of the surgery, uh, homemade surgery. Um, we do a lot of artworks at Africa Burn, um, so if any of you were there last year, you, would, you might have seen this thing. Um, the whole idea was to try and try to move uh, 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 your voice or your, your like Twitter messages across the sky like a shooting star. Um, so you'd stand on the one side, you put your hands on the artwork, record a message, and it shoots across the sky on helium, oh, hydrogen weather balloons. Quite dangerous. And while we were there, we also blew this artwork up from Danny Popper <laughs> with all our spare hydrogen. Um, then we have a pet project called Humanoid. Uh, it's a performance, a robotic kind of emulation thing where we do a whole lot of visuals and also crazy graphics and try and abstract the DJ away so it's, it's not such an egocentric thing, it's kind of more um, anonymous and constantly changing. And then this is a project we're doing with um, one of the schools, Robotic Orchestra. Uh, we built some boards up to control some handmade solenoids, uh, pump out MIDI onto these things and then the kids can pull up their own instruments and play a whole orchestra. We played like Vivaldi. Um, 12 MIDI tracks at once with their own homemade instruments. And then we also consult on corporate hackathons. This is for Standard Bank. Uh, it's like Dragon's Den. Uh, we're running out of time. Rocking the Daisies, you'll see an artwork um, that we're busy working on. And then we're going to be, uh, we're helping out with uh, Maker Fair. And we're also going to be having a whole lot of uh, nice demos and things there, artworks. Is that Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sharing your uh, your work with everyone. And um, please, co everyone, come to the market hack tomorrow and have a go. And also, we have uh, two other guys uh, from London, co-design and pair conductive, who will have uh, more work there. And so, I know there are a lot of makers in the room, and also um, this this load of maker spaces kind of popping up and then we've got of course the Maker Fair, you're doing the Maker Fair Africa in, in December and um, of course there's loads of individual makers that are kind of not connected but I was what, what I was kind of wanted to take is to, to ask you it's, um, all is um, if um, if you think that all these like bursting like of the maker movement the last few years if um, if this is going to actually you know have in the next years to come, if this is just a trend right now, or if this is something that you know is actually changing the way of uh, our education is working, or uh, what the what is the impact that is going to have in the future? Is it going to have a, a like bigger impact, or is it just like individual communities of makers that are doing things together, and um, you know it's going to stay there? Would you like to yeah. Well. I, I haven't met so many makers before in my life, but <laughs> from from my perspective, I, I think the maker mentality is like a, a pulling away from the corporate lifestyle of, of working for a single boss, a single employer, and trying to make things out of the resources that you have available to you. and. With the, the knowledge available online, there's really nothing that you can't do. 
uh, you can learn how to do electronics, you can learn how to machine, you can learn how to do just about anything online. Um, so I, I think the, the, the way that the world works at the moment with degrees and the educational system is under an enormous pressure to compete with, with the online learning capability. Um, so yes, definitely, I think the maker movement will change how, how the world works, yes. I just want to add on to what he said, uh, more specifically with the, um, the corporates. A lot of the guys that we come in contact with uh, come to us because we, we usually use open source hardware and integrate it into an end, end user product for people. And we found over the last two, three years, increasing number of people come to us with an entire stack of Arduino shields, uh, wanting to collapse that down into a single product and then actually go to market with it. Um, and then also at the hacker spaces, we refer to a lot of the people that go there as corporate refugees, where in their day job, they usually don't have the ability to act out the ideas that they can or that they have. Um, they don't have the freedom or the resources, but recently we found that uh, one of our, our bigger customers, a rather large, one of the, uh, the big five banks in the country, within their very large banking building quite close to here, they're setting up a makerspace specifically so their staff can innovate, test, uh, prototype things for the for their company to move forward, and they actually quite actively embracing the whole maker movement. Yeah, actually, the, um, the the fact that they're embracing the, the the whole maker movement, they were they were spending about between two hundred thousand and a million bucks on a concept. Um, they're pouring that money straight into the into the hackathons and maker spaces, um, and the output is exponentially higher. Um, I mean, one one hackathon they produced and prototyped and and demonstrated fifty products. And that was in a twenty four hour hack. Um, before they do one product, it would take six months and it would never get to market. So the, the maker movement is definitely pouring fuel on this fire with uh, corporate innovation. So I think um, that's awesome. And I totally, we see the same thing happening. I think what's interesting is uh, there's a lot of geeks and engineers and not even engineers, just creatives who are interested in the maker movement and are making themselves and are excited about these new te technologies and tools. But, and to your point, education is under huge pressure to support or even deal with this major challenge of keeping up with the Joneses in terms of technology and are changing so rapidly and there's no way that curriculum and everything else can actually keep up with this stuff. So maker spaces tend to help solve that problem, creating workshop environments where people can just be comfortably innovating is a really powerful thing to do. And I mean, we're finding that a lot of big companies are building, trying to build their own internal innovation labs, or at least trying to jump onto existing innovation labs so that they can really understand how to make use of or integrate this maker thinking into their processes. It's a bit more about entrepreneurial approaches rather than helping to support entrepreneurial approaches to um, building businesses. So these big corporates who become corporate refugees, you know, people become poor corporate refugees, they have excuses to stay there because they can actually innovate within their businesses. And that's a really interesting that ha that, that thing that happens. And technology will save us. We are interested in helping everybody who's not already a bit of a geek, who has already jumped into the geek ocean. Uh, we're trying to kind of be the doorway drug for them. Because we, we make it a little bit more sort of design appealing, uh, a little bit more sort of uh, hand-holding. But then once they're in there, you know, hopefully they'll be there to stay. I just want to say, as, a, as an artist and as a creator, I think the spaces offer a great network to be able to achieve what you want to achieve. And if you often have a vision, it's something that you can't necessarily achieve on your own. And having a network at your disposal that you can learn from really helps to achieve your goal. My comment would be on uh, how the maker movement has really made it so much easier for people to use technology. Like, I think of doing undergraduate engineering and you go through like three weeks of lectures and courses and like you blow up so many things just trying to like flash an LED you know you're learning all this hardcore stuff and this was there was no Arduino then and then you know after I graduate I like go past like a workshop that Tegan has and she's teaching people how to flash an LED in like the first 15 minutes of the of this class and I think that's just a you know a very telling thing on how much easier it is to do these these really complex things and that invites a lot of people from different spaces to come and you know explore technology which before they may have been a bit like fearful of
So I think that it's a very welcoming thing is also helping it grow. Uh, thank you. And um, I guess the, the other thing that um, I was, I've been interested in is that how, for example, um, I come I, I live in London and there are loads of maker spaces in London and maker fairs as well across the UK. But uh, I come from Greece and there's not this, there are some maker spaces like now. But this, uh, what I always had in my mind about making is that you know there, there was like loads of makers that you know they wouldn't identify themselves as part of the maker movement, or but it was always about you know problem solving and. Uh, uh, doing things for their community and and I, I wonder you know um, I, I'm sure there are everywhere people like that and I wonder how you know uh, maker fairs or how maker spaces can help map you know bring all these people together and um, you know just help them support them with the, the work in their community and of course you know loads of you know most of people are doing a lot of you're developing kids or you're doing a lot of educational work that um, you know just and helping like doing what the schools or <laughs> should be doing and they don't do so um, yeah I wonder you know with your uh, with the upcoming maker fair and um, if this you know if you have plans you know just to how how you're planning to kind of bring all these communities together or if you have already you know links with this community because I know many people they just don't even realize that there is a maker community they just do it you know they have like a it's like a parallel world of doing things and like you know uh, building things because they need to to build them and uh, so it's like hacking for uh, you know for problem solving or so yeah I just wonder if you know you have any kind of <laughs> So you said it's like a parallel world, and I, I really, really believe that is happening. I think all jobs right now in the world are getting pulled in two directions, essentially. So it's either you're getting forced to upskill, so you, you're broadening out into multiple industries. It's code, it's machining, it's business, it's, it's all these things at the same time. And then on the other side, it's the people that are like the bank tellers. Right, so they are replaced by the ATM, and this movement of everything getting automated, it's, it's software, who knows what an accountant's job is going to look like, if uh, there, uh, all of these things, everything that can be automated and optimized will be automated and optimized, and it's just a force of capitalism. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's survival, right? Yeah. So the people that are getting left behind are the uneducated, the, the poor. And uh, because of the, the, the cheapness of electronics, um, perhaps it's, it's automating farming. It's, it's, it's helping the poor to, to feed themselves. Um, perhaps it's off the grid, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so for, uh, in, in terms of Maker make a Fair, um, one of the things we're working on with, um, with House for Hack, a hacker space in uh, Littleton, um, is, um, so they've, they've got a program, some of the founders they have got a program with African School of Excellence, and they, they're um, actively teaching them programming. Programming costs almost nothing, um, you literally need an old computer, and you can, you can get going. Um, so we, we're joining up with them to actually teach them the hardware hacking side of things and that you don't need a lot of money. You can repurpose, re reuse, upcycle um, existing kit, things that people have thrown away. Um, so we, we, we're trying to build a relationship um, between schools like that and um, some very, very elitist private schools. Um, the other thing, we, one of our goals is to try and bridge that uh, social divide there. So you've got these ultra wealthy kids who have no idea what's going on in the, the lowest sort of echelons of the country. And you have some really, really smart kids who've never had these, these um, sort of opportunities and experiences. So what we're doing, especially with the Robert Orchestra, is to try and bridge these kids. Music is a, it's a common language, common thing, uh, and we, we want to try and get them to teach each other, solve similar problems, and I think those sort of projects are going to be seen a lot at, at, at Maker Faire. Um, Maker Faire is about that. It's about bringing everyone together, kind of showing what's common, um, and, and really trying to solve proper problems um, with as little tools as you have available. Also just on the logistics side of Maker Faire, um, one of the reasons that we decided, or eventually it came down to from Maker Faire Africa side, 
to have it in the city was it is ubiquitous access for anyone of any social standing to come to make a fair. Um, they don't have to go out to some farm or some some estate or or a specific venue. They could literally catch any of one of the trains, any one of the buses, any one of the taxis mm -hmm. into the city and have access to make a fair. Um, so they'll be parallel to to the exhibitions being held at at, at Museum of Af Africa Design. Um, they've also got classes running at WITS, uh, training classes, training seminars, talks, um, education events, specifically so we can involve everyone that has access to the city. Um, so we do not exclude anyone. Okay, and um, we, we are part of a like, digital art and games festival, and um, many people, when at least when I started working as a digital art curator, many or most of my colleagues were expecting that everything will be on a screen and uh, it's great to see like here for example how games we have both physical and digital games so just I wanted to go back to your DIY gamer and because um, uh, it's actually you did say that you know you can create your own game and then you actually make something as well so how I just wanted to ask you like how do you think that the maker movement and you know how how does it what does it bring to like Art, you know, to, to games, for example, what is why is it important, you know, to to you know to, to learn to to build things as well, not just to look at the screen and interact with it. Okay, so the screen sucks. Um, <laughs> it's a means to an end. It's a great tool, um, and sometimes it's nice to veg in front of you and to break on the floor when you drop your phone in front of all these people. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the screen is a great tool, but as you say, it's super flat. It's not something you can grab onto, you can't jump into it, etc. And I've had a minor obsession with moving away from the screen forever since I left Ritz, actually. Um, makers, well, just people in general. Like, South Africa is full of resourcefulness, full of resourceful makers. They don't necessarily think of themselves as ma makers. We all know the saying, a boom, a plan, yeah? We always have been able to just make a plan, get on with something, fix something, jury rig something, whatever it is, you can just figure it out, right? And that's amazing, that's a culture of making already. That's like, I mean, I'm just seeing this stuff, it makes me so excited to see what's going on in, in Joburg and, and around. The DIY Gamer is really intended to try and be a means to an end in terms of digital learning. So weirdly enough, it is a physical thing, but the thing is people learn better, there's a lot of research around learning, where you learn so much better if it's not just you looking at a screen, it's not just you listening to a person, it's not just you writing something down, it's, it's all of those things. So if you are looking at a screen, typing something out, uh, attaching it to something, soldering to that thing, learning how to use switches, learning how to do that, understanding what an input and output is, if you're doing all these things simultaneously in order to do one thing which is have a fun game, then suddenly your, your, your ability to learn is an ex exponential curve, it's not one of those linear ones. We're all about the power curve, yeah? Everybody likes a little hockey puck. I mean, hockey stick. Um, so DIY Gamer for us is super exciting because it's that long tail of learning that actually looks like a hockey, puck, a hockey stick. <laughs> I'm not explaining that very well at all. <laughs> hockey puck, like it's a step flat. <laughs> um, your, your work also brings together like loads of traditional, like, uh, you know, plays. Um, do, do you want to so, <laughs> like, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of uh, to ask if you wanted to say something about you know what is bringing together of like digital art, but also traditional kind of uh, uh, yes. crafts. And, um, and I suppose because I started doing fine arts, and you know you get told that this was this is what an artwork must be or should be, and then suddenly you can make lights turn on or make things move based on senses, and suddenly like a whole door. A whole world opens, and but and it's quite difficult to to cross that boundary from from a painting or a photograph or a sculpture to something that is digital. Whether it is even if it's screen based, there's a challenge there as well, or to something sculptural which is interactive and gives meaning through the interaction, and suddenly it becomes an art. And that is a constant challenge that I do have to think about. And for me, it's not an issue, but I have to understand that people who interact with my work. They don't always know that they don't always see it as being an artwork or an, or an object which is as regarded as a painting or a photograph. 
it's also about changing people's perception of what, yes. and it's just breaking down all these categories of like, you know, working with just, yeah. not just doing painting or sculpture or games. Or, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, I think we, because we are running out of time, I was wondering if anybody has any questions from the audience? Okay. I'm sorry, I have to run, I'm super late for something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question. <laughs> I, w I was wondering, because um, now Daniel's left, it's just the South African makers left. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was wondering, um, what, what, how, all of you, I mean, are actually very, very different. Maybe some of you are similar, but there's a lot of difference in your practices. What, how, what is your sort of future vision of making and people and public interacting with the stuff? Like, do you have sort of dreams for what something could be? I know you guys are a maker fair, and that's something quite exciting. But, yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah, right, no, from, my, uh, from my personal side, um, specifically from the digital art side, uh, we tend to like making artworks for Africa Burn, which is the regional Burning Man festival, and there you're pretty much guaranteed about 10,000 people playing with your artwork. Um, it's pretty much the thing to be want to do. Uh, it does break after a few days because dust gets in everywhere. But um, I don't know, there's probably a more practical solution to seeing the future of making other than artworks at a no, desert that. festival. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, th I think we're, um, where we're kind of being, we're moving in is, is the incubation space. So, so guys that are really, um, like, I think we, we, we believe that, uh, maybe we're biased, but people in this country need to study science, engineering, art, or some sort of philosophical thing and combine them somehow, solve proper problems. Um, and then take those, those skills that they've learned and be able to quickly and rapidly deploy them. Try and fail fast, try and really get out there and, and, try, and try and actively solve the problems. Um, the open hardware stuff, I mean, uh, there's a lot of locally produced op open hardware which is starting to pop up. And, and it's uh, things like energy monitors, very precise, cheap energy monitors, which is a problem in this country. And I think as we're starting to get the confidence to, to do these things on our own, um, you'll see these more independent things and, and more uh, appropriate to this country. We're not just copying what's happening in the States. Um, we're not just copying what's in Europe. And I think give it another year and you'll see a lot of uh, quite mature um, world-class stuff coming out of, out of this country. I think we, we, we are getting there. Um, I, I've actually given this a lot of thought, trying to predict the future 40 years, 400 years, and you know, it's, it's very difficult to do when things are moving this quickly, right? Um, <laughs> what I see technology being is a tool to solve problems, right? And what we're seeing now is explosion in the kinds of tools that we're capable of producing. So suddenly we're able to fix more problems than we could in the past, and we've got more people that can fix them. And I see this as a means to allow people to automate, well, I keep using that, that word, right? But getting up in the morning every day, going and working in a, in a toll booth somewhere, just collecting money and punching it into the toll, that's no way to live. Right, and that's reality for a lot, a lot of people, and that's so that's reality in a lot of different jobs, uh, bus drivers, train drivers. It's it's all these repetitive jobs are, it's it's actually a crime to keep that going, and we've got the means to end that. I don't know how that affects the rest of the economy. The, the, uh, this is it's inevitable, right? But we can help it along. Yeah. One thing that um, I'm quite excited about in the future, and it comes down to like the makerspace thing. Like Guru mentioned, he's got this makerspace with all these tools and stuff. And you know, these days it becomes more apparent to me that nobody fixes things. Like I'm sure you've all experienced like maybe something in your car or something like some home appliance is broken. Everybody just wants to replace it with like a new one. That's pretty much the only thing people do these days. And I think it's so cool to maybe have a space where maybe you don't know the skills or you don't have the skills. But you take it to this maker space and there's the guy who like knows about electronics and there's the guy who knows how to like mill metal and then you're like, oh we can fix this. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, having access to 
or not longer you know needing to replace everything, but also being able to fix things and in the pro in the process learning. Uh, so I'm I think that's what I'm looking forward to the most in like this kind of thing is like collaboration and learning and you know being able to to start solve problems like fix fix some of the things that are broken. Uh, one, one, what kind of the thing that I find really exciting is how artists and um, they, they use tools like that to involve, to engage people in amazing like um, you know activities like social movement activities or or um, um, you know protests and stuff like that. So for example, I don't know if you know the uh, recently uh, Paolo Tirio's uh, project Loophole for All uh, won the Arts Electronica Prize. And Loophole for All is a project where he basically exposed over 200,000 companies in the Cayman Islands that were not paying tax and he used the same kind of you know tools that they are using to give it to the public and they can so basically they can because all these companies are anonymous everybody can register and buy like shares from these companies and they can start invoicing and they not paying tax and it's uh, so this is just one example then there are so many artists who work for example with communities and they uh, like in for example in Fukushima after the, ex the disaster and they were helping people to register like to monitor their environment but also um, people who built like uh, work to uh, to uh, monitor for example uh, like the pollution levels in the ocean or other things like that so it's a uh, so it's just, for me, that's the great thing that is happening, that how um, artists, for example, become, uh, you know, they just create tools for all of us just to, to um, you know, just to look, not to, to take action, but also to change things in our, in our world and in our environment. And I think this might be, you know, will probably become bigger and bigger if, you know, more of these tools are accessible and open source grows even bigger and bigger. So, um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to what is going to happen <laughs> in the future. So, um, I don't know if there's any other question, because I'm not sure how much time we've got, because there's another talk here. So, okay, so do, are there any other kind of questions that people have for the, for the panel? Or can Okay, great. So uh, thank you all very much for coming and thank you all you guys for sharing your work and um, we are at the, um, at the market hack tomorrow near the neighborhoods market from uh, 10 till 3 and there will be loads of uh, great stuff to play with and make so please do come and join us. Thank you.